but I want what you want. You know, I, I find this completely fascinating here as we begin to look at this. Uh, maybe I should back up just a little and, and, and kind of do some, uh, you know, kind of maybe a, a, a recap over chapter 7, chapter 8, so that we can come back up to speed with where we are. Uh, but, you know, continuing to learn from the Old Testament, man. The Old Testament is a wonderful place to learn and to be encouraged within the faith and, 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 and to take the historical elements of what happened with Israel, what happened with the Jewish people, you know, the, the, the Hebrew Bible as it's called, right? The Old Testament, our Old Testament. And, and, and in this, we find that in chapter 7, that there was a great starting line that, that, that under Samuel's leadership and as he began to get going that he, he didn't waste any time. He called the people to a place of changing direction. And this great start happened when he encouraged the people to put away the secular practices. Okay, I wanna do some Bible Olympics with you, so I'm gonna maybe run our study a little bit different here tonight. Uh, but I wanna engage you in Bible study. This is Wednesday night, we're not under a big rush to get into a next service, so we're kinda chill here, or as chill as I can be, I guess. Uh, but I wanna engage with you by way of Bible study. So, so take your Bible, if you can follow along, awesome. If you can't, just listen, okay? I want you to go to the New Testament, to the book of Colossians, okay? It's one of the epistles that Paul wrote, Colossians. Colossians chapter three. Now, we will remember this, that uh, as Samuel called them to put away their secular, secular practices, we know that in the New Testament, specifically here in the book of Colossians, uh, that, that, that Paul is speaking about the preeminence of Christ, that this is one of his prison epistles. And, and, and what he is doing is he's trying to bring the people back to the characteristics of what it looks like to be a Christian. And down in verse number five, he begins to lay out some of these traits, okay? Some of the qualities, if you will, of Christian living. And I'm magnifying these here tonight because I, I, I think so often that we can get into this spot where the conversation terms, and it can feel super religious. Do this and don't do that. No, it's not about do this and don't do that. But it is about understanding here by way of application, that the people in 1 Samuel chapter 7, that, that, that Samuel called them as the prophet, as the spiritual leader, he called them to put away the secular practices, to step away from those things. Paul, in the New Testament, he is encouraging Christian living. He is pointing out what it looks like, the qualities, the characteristics of the things that we are to take off and the things that we are to put on. And I want you to look with me at this list. <clears throat> He says in verse five, Colossians three and five, he says, therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. He, he is talking about all the, the internal wranglings of desires and thoughts and emotions and all of that stuff that flows out of the heart of mankind, man and woman, and, and, and what that stuff begins to do is to manifest itself within our lives. He goes through this list and he says, fornication and uncleanness and passion and evil desire and covetousness and he works his way down through a number of verses. I'm not gonna define all these things here tonight, but I will make mention of this, that when he talks about evil desire, it's like, well, what is evil desire? Does that mean if I watch like something spooky on TV at Halloween time that I have an evil desire? Is that what that means? No, that's not what that means. But, but evil desire is best defined as a mode of thinking about what is forbidden. Think about that. Evil desire, a mode of thinking about what is forbidden. When, when, when our thought life becomes so preoccupied with something that I know that I, it's like, dude, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't be thinking about that. And yet that's the dominating thing that comes on. It, it, it's almost like we crack open a doorway, if you will, to the enemy of our soul. And it's like, hmm, I'm chewing on this. And the next thing you know, that silly little enemy of our soul, he begins to plant thoughts within our minds and the next thing you know, your whole day has been captivated with something you know. It's like, why am I even thinking about that? It's so weird. Samuel was encouraging them to put away the secular practices, the secular things, the things that are without God. He encouraged them to turn away from that. Again, Paul is doing the same thing here in this particular list. All right, let's flip back to our text in Samuel, okay? So back in Samuel, you know, as, as, we, as we went through chapter seven, uh, they did that, and then uh, they moved a little bit farther, and, and that was is that once 
Samuel told them to put these things away, they welcomed it. Well, that's great. Because we know in the New Testament that, that Jesus in Mark 1 and 15, he gives the why. He, he comes on the scene and he says, repent, and he gives the why. Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is why you and I are concerned about what Christian living looks like. This is why you, are, you and I are, are, are Bible students because we want to understand not only the fond affections of grace and goodness that God has given to us, the promises, but we also want to understand what it looks like to stay out of the weeds and the things that God has given to us, the good qualities, the good characteristics, so that we can navigate a successful Christian life without always getting beat up. Uh, by a show of hands in here, who wants to get beat up? Yeah, I think you're with me. Nobody wants to get beat up. If somebody's got to do the beating, I want to be on the right side of the baseball bat. You know, I, I don't want to get beat up. It's not cool. You don't feel good after you get beat up. Well, the third thing that we saw in chapter seven was this, is that uh, finally they went to the place of accepting Saul's call to gather for prayer. And you and I know this from a New Testament standpoint, that in James chapter five, verse 16, that, that we find that, that, that James lays out the brother of Jesus, right? They called him Old Camel Knees. Uh, this dude got his historical name because they say that he spent eight hours a day praying on his knees. So he had some gnarly looking knees. You may think you have knobby knees. Ain't nothing compared to James. James had some lumps and bumps on his knees there. But in James 5.16, it, 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 it talks about the, the overcoming aspect of a, of a man of prayer, that, that, that overcoming these things, man, when we go into prayer and understanding that we're looking to God to move the mountains, it is through prayer that we're overcoming, that is we're offloading the things onto the Lord's shoulders, okay? We get that. What's the point of all of that from chapter seven? Nothing more than this, that if we draw close to God, that God, God will draw close to us. Also James, four and eight. And, and, and what began to happen in these people's lives all the way back in chapter seven? Well, they began to grow in strength. They began to grow in blessings. God began to anchor down and give them victory over their problems. There was a restoration of losses that began to come back. The losses that they had experienced by way of the, the different territories and cities, they began to you know, take those back over again. And all of a sudden, they had this peace in their life to move forward. Now, I know that that is a historical narrative of what happened many, many, many uh, centuries ago, I, I get that, and I, and I understand that it, w it took, crazy, uh, took place across the land of Palestine, or what it was called back then, but they are real people, and there is a real narrative that took place with that. Well, the chapter turns from chapter 7, it goes into chapter 8. You'll remember with me, that was our last study there. And what did we talk about? Well, we went through and we began to, to see that progress that they made, but no sooner did they make progress a couple decades down the line, than all of a sudden they started living in a jacked up, funky way, and we discussed about how our past can paralyze us. We dove in by way of practical applications and I brought so many things to the surface that if we are always looking backwards about the failures within our life, that we are going to become paralyzed and never make forward progress. A very simple truth for us to hang on to. We don't want to live life looking in the rearview mirror. We want to understand what Paul said in Philippians. 3 and 13, I believe is what it is. Forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward towards the upward call in Jesus Christ. Navigating forward, not navigating looking backwards, okay? It would be super strange and funny that if you saw somebody going 70 miles an hour down I-25 backwards in the fast lane. That'd have to be a pretty good driver, okay? Um, I actually kind of wish I could do that because I would do something fun with it. But you get what I'm saying. It's not the healthiest way to, to go down I-25 driving backwards at 70. So the same thing for us in our life, man. We want to go forward. And what did we learn? We learned practically that the, that the cultivation of godly responses is something important. And when we cultivate godly responses, we're taking off that which is, is bad, and we're putting on that which is characteristic of Christ, that which the Lord has called us to put on. And when, the, we, and when we're putting on, abiding in the Lord, taking his word in, studying the scriptures, just walking with Jesus, then this curbs the bad appetites and the bad passions that so often want to come in and fill the void of our thought life, our emotion, and even our time around our lives. It curbs this stuff. We also learn that we're not to take advantage of God's grace. How so? By going into a place to where we're actually 
um, you know, premeditatedly kind of setting up bad behavior. You know, and we talked about, hey, man, what's, what, what goes on in Vegas? Stays in Vegas. Okay, one sinner in the house. I'm with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we understand what we're saying, right? Okay? We don't want to go to a place where it's like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm just trying to premeditate bad behavior. I, you know, and I, I, I do such a good job at premeditating it. I even got a phrase for it. What goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. Okay? You get, you know, we, we, we kind of got that. And then chapter eight ended this way, is that God was telling Samuel, he says, listen, forewarn the people, tell them this, that this decision at this time is not good. Don't do it, okay? Your eyeballs on your Bible. Uh, chapter eight, verse number nine, take a look at this. It says, now therefore, he says, heed their voice, God talking to Samuel, however, you, Samuel, shall forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So this is the picture of what took place of, of you know, the, uh, the prelude, if you will, to chapter nine and the anointing of the king that they wanted. They wanted a king. They wanted something. And, and, and all of this stuff that was here. Now, notice with me also, 1 Samuel 8 and 18, Okay. That, that after God uses Samuel to forewarn them, and after God uses verses 10 to 17 to describe to them the type of king that this guy is going to be, that, that in verse 18, he says, and you will cry out in that day because your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Oh my goodness. Write this down, Christian, and remember this, Okay. God forgives our sins when we confess it, for sure. However, many times the consequences remain. And it is from the remaining of these consequences that the scars begin to pop up in our lives. Mm, God forgives our sins. Yes, this is true. But so often the consequences will remain there. And God, you're gonna find a merciful act of God in chapter nine here upon them. But the scars, the consequences of that stuff remains. Listen, this, this past weekend, we, we, uh, you know, I, made a, um, you know I, I made a statement about sin. Th that the reason that sin is bad is because it hurts people. It hurts people. It's not a religious thing. God is against sin, not because he wants to squelch our fun or limit our lives or, or, or you know, draw us to be you know, a bunch of sticks in the muds or something like that. God doesn't want to do anything like that. But, but, but the reason that we have the identification of sin and, and some of the characteristics or things that, that lead us into a place of sin is so that we can put up and we can remain in Christ, keep the protective barriers there so that we don't hurt ourselves. Super important that we capture that. Well, all of this comes down to our point number one. Point number one, give me, give me, give me. I find this super funny, maybe. Maybe that's the right word. But in these first 10 verses here, we find the guy that's fixing to be anointed as king over Israel, chasing donkeys in the mountains. Now, for you Bible students that know anything about donkeys, we know this, that, that Balaam, out of the book of Numbers, that he got into it with his donkey, right? He begins to argue with his donkey in such a way and whipping and beating and having a conversation with his donkey and his donkey responds. Now, I don't know what type of guy that, that can hear donkeys. You know, I don't know if there's donkey whispers, but the reality of it is, is that Psalm 32 verses eight and nine, David writing now, he talks about, listen, uh, God's speaking to him. He says, listen, don't become like the horse or like the mule which requires bit and bridle, or else it won't come near you. Near you. Don't be so stinking stubborn here. So, so, so Saul, running through the mountains, chasing his dad's donkeys, trying to you know, wrangle these things up, and he has no idea what's fixing to happen, but he's fixing to be anointed the king over Israel secretly the very next day in chapter 10. Now, when we compare this to David, what was David like? David wasn't chasing donkeys in the mountains. David was out in the fields tending to sheep. David was God's anointed guy. He was the king. He was the one that, that God wanted to put up. But the description of Saul, look at verse, uh, chapter 9, verse number 2, that this guy, he was a good-looking, handsome guy, and he stood head and shoulders every, over everybody there, in the, you know, in the city, in the kingdom, you know, amongst his nation, if you will. 
a good looking guy. He was fancy and flashy and all of this outward stuff. He had it going on apparently by way of looks at least. And, and, and this is what God ends up selecting as being, you want a leader? Here's your leader. He's a great big old dude, but he's a, such a coward. He won't go out and fight Goliath. We're going to get a little shepherd boy that comes in and fight him. If this is the type of king that you want, here he is. He's a donkey chaser. Now, I don't know if I developed that point about donkey chasing, but donkey chasing, think about it. These folks, the, the, this community, this group, this people group, if you will, they had rejected what God wanted to give them. They themselves were a bunch of donkeys, and now their king is chasing donkeys. David's leading sheep. Saul is tending donkeys in some capacity. I don't know if there's any flavor in that to the different style of churches that are out there. I'm not sure. I'm just saying, give me, give me, give me. That's what they wanted. Give me, give me, give me. Uh, in an article today posted by uh, Psychology Today, this is backdated to January 2015, it says this. It says, according to some ec experts, selfish behavior is not only immoral, but it's also bad for your own psychological well-being. Give me, give me, give me. Well, I'm not a psychologist, and I, I think it's like the first time I've ever quoted a psychologist in some regards. But apparently there's some justifiable things in there to show that selfishness is not a good thing. It's not good for yourself. And for a Christian to demand it our own way before God, it demonstrates something about our hearts. It demonstrates that, that we have refused to trust God. Proverbs chapter three and five, you'll, you'll remember that with me, right? Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And when I begin to, to, to anchor my two feet down on a rock or a position or whatever, and I, and, and, and I try to get stubborn before God, the only thing that I'm showing is that my attitude of this give me, give me, give me, give me, the heart attitude has changed. That, that no longer am I trusting in the Lord with all of my heart, but rather I've become the sole focus of my own little universe. Second thing is this, is that when I move to this place of saying, give me, give me, give me, I want a king, I want this, I want quail, I want meat, I want manna, I want this job, I want that house, I want that man, I want that woman, I want this many kids, I want a better church. Whatever the big give me, give me, give me is, is that we misunderstand God's guiding hand within our life and his absolute goodness. The third thing is, and I'm going to read this one to you out of Job's five, Job 5 and 12, is that it only results in frustration. You just begin to get frustrated. Job 5 and 12, it says, he frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot carry out their plans. Have you ever been in a place within your life where you've tried to wrestle so hard? It's like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And you've only become frustrated. The more harder you try, the more frustrated you get maybe that's because it's a position of like you're stomping your feet, maybe not outwardly, but maybe positionally on, on the emotions or on the thoughts or, the, or your will where it says, I'm gonna do this. Now, now think with me for just a second. The world says, well, you go for it and you think the positive thoughts and you don't look back. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that it's up to a man to plan his ways, but it's the Lord that directs his steps. It, it, the, the, the Bible teaches us in the New Testament capacity that, that we are to roll off the, 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 uh, the affairs, the, 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 the details, the opportunities is the word I'm looking for. That we're to roll those opportunities off to God by asking him, Lord, would you work on my behalf in this situation? And we give him a need. We, we also are to yield to the place of, Lord, not my will be done, but your will be done. We yield to the Lord in that. And when we're not doing that, it's only because we haven't understood where God has been leading us. And it leads to frustration. Listen, we study the scriptures to learn about God. We study the scriptures to, dis to discover how much he loves us and to how many promises are there. We study the scriptures knowing that from the position of faith in, in what God has given us within his full counsel, but more even, maybe more specifically, under the promises of the New Testament, 
that we study it so that we might know what is pleasing to our God and what God has given to us already. Hey, I can ask for X, Y, and Z in, in, in a very emphatic position because it's like, yeah, God has promised this to me. But if we push off his counsel, then we're gonna get blindsided by a bad decision. <laughs> I hate making bad decisions. It seems like I got so many of them I've made. Hosea 4 and 6 says this, that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. It's a verse that many of you know. It's describing either ignorance or a willful resistance, both sides. That God's people are destroyed for being willfully resistant or not knowing about it. And that applies to all of us within this room because the balance and the spread of Christians that are in here, some people have walked with God for a number of years. Others are just coming to walk with the Lord. And, and, and on either side of the tracks there, if you will, that we, get, we, we can unnecessarily suffer setback by saying, oh God, I didn't even know what God said not to do that. On the other side, it's like, well, yeah, I know he said that, but I ain't doing it. That's the older Christians. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> All right, this leads to point number two. We gotta make some progress here. <clears throat> Uh, I'm taking liberty tonight, in case you haven't felt this or you haven't seen this, is that this chapter nine is all about chasing donkeys and you know, going to a meal with 30 people and, and then going to sleep on the roof. Okay, so that's chapter nine. I'm just trying to bring in some application here to this particular chapter uh, because you know, I don't know what you feel about chasing donkeys, um, you know, going up to have a meal and uh, going to sleep on a roof, but that's your topics in that, that particular chapter. Uh, but point number two here for us, by way of application, getting to yes through no. Okay. How can I rely upon God when it's not going as planned? I don't know if you've ever thought about that. I, I, I don't know if you've ever, again, I, I mean, I, I've walked with Jesus now for 26 years, and, and, and I hate to, to spill out all my good stories. I want to leave room for you guys to share some of this pain. But boy, there's been all kinds of things where I've just become so frustrated. It's like, ah, in certain segments, you know, I, I feel like there's, there's parts of my Christian walk over the decades where I've kind of impl imploded on myself because I haven't rightly understood. So how can I trust or rely upon God when everything is not going as planned? I thought this Christian thing was all about ease and these and this, and, and, and man, I just thought it was gonna be a much better life. Well, it is, because Hebrews tells us that everything is better with Jesus, that's true, but we need to have an understanding about what it looks like to go through closed doors. Last week on Wednesday night, um, you know, our, our, our youth guy, David, was up here, and he shared with us out of Acts chapter 16. And in the starting of his message, he talked about all of these closed doors that, that Paul came up to. Acts 16, verse number 6 and 7, and even 8 it says that Paul went, he went through Phygia, he went through the region of Galatia, and, and he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word anywhere there in Asia Minor. And then it says that he went into Mysia, and they tried to go into Bithynia, that is north and west, farther by the Black Sea, getting way out there. But the Spirit did not permit them. And so they, they passed by Mysia, and then they came down the Troas. And they didn't even get a chance to preach the gospel there, but they did receive a word from the Lord. So they had about three or four different closed doors. Paul did. He's trying to advance the kingdom of God. He's trying to be about God's business. And yet closed door, closed door, closed door. Listen, I want you and I to understand this, that anytime there's a closed door before us, it's because God is trying to get us to readjust our steps, to readjust the path that we're on. That's the reason for closed doors. Well, how can I say that so, so powerfully and emphatically? Well, for this, James 1 and 17 tells us that every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of life with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Hmm. 1 John 1 and 5 tells us that God is light and there's no darkness in him at all. Think about the picture, guys. That our little earth and our little solar system here, as it goes around, listen, we have the daytime, and guess what? We're spinning so cool by the sun, and there it is. You know, the sun's out, light's out, things are good. And then our little earth continues to travel in its orbit and all that stuff, and the next thing you know, we've got the shadows of the moon, right? And it becomes dark outside like it is right now. Uh, what's the whole point? What's the whole emphasis? The emphasis is nothing more than, than we recognize 
that when God is giving us decisions and directions and, and he's trying to help us to readjust our steps with these closed doors or even open doors, that, that, that God is not whimsical. He, he is not flippant like, okay, day sun, okay, night moon. Which God am I gonna get here? Am I gonna get the Old Testament God or the New Testament God right now? Do you understand what I'm saying in that? No, 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 no. We, we can recognize this. That while the, the day and the night is always swirling about and changing, God never changes. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says that. He's the same. He changes not. And that can bring us great comfort when we're up against closed doors. Because we know that he's bringing us the best. He has the best in mind for us. Even though I may not be able to see beyond that closed door. Or even though I may not mentally or emotionally identify with the pressure of the circumstance. God is working and we're able to, to, to trust in that. All right, second thing under getting to yes through no. Second thing, sometimes building trust requires a different route. All kinds of biblical examples for that. But I'll read you from the New Living Translation, Exodus 13 and 17. It says this, God bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. He says, when Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through the Philistine territory. Even though that was the shortest route to the promised land, God said, if the people are faced with battle, they might change their mind and return to Egypt. Hmm. What do we see? We, we see rather than taking the easiest path and keeping the people in a place of comfort and ease and moving them here into this new land and this new territory, God decides to take them down into a detour. And it can be so frequently like that in our own lives, that God takes us on a detour. And from the surface, we may not capture the detour, but God is doing it for a particular reason. The same reason he did it for them is the same reason that he does it for you and I, and that is, is that our confidence and our trust in him would deepen. And he takes us through these, <laughs> the long way sometimes. Why? Because it takes a little time for our courage to be developed. It takes a little bit of time for that trust to, to be developed in God. Listen, if you haven't trusted God for very much, then when, it, when, when something big comes your way, then you're not gonna trust him in that big time. You know, I have a, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a pastor, a uh, guy that was up at um, Uplift Vale. Uh, his name is uh, Levi Lesko. And, and he made the statement up there at this concert thing of always training for the trial. And man, that was something that just stuck with me. Training for the trial. God will allow the detours to come into our life and for us to take the long road so that we could learn, learn, learn to trust him in deep water. We need that. The external challenges, you know, what do they do for us? They toughen us up, quite frankly. They shape us. They, they, they suddenly we move from, from such a, um, you know, we're all this way. We're, 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 all, you know, we're all perpetually seeking our own comfort. But as we perpetually seek our own comfort, we become soft on the inside. We become so self-focused that it's a give me, give me, give me, give me. And when our lives are only consumed with ease and laying back and, and, and we have no struggle, we have no pain, we have no challenges, we have no adversity, then we're just a bunch of couch potatoes enjoying our own bag of Doritos. <laughs> now I like Doritos, so I don't know if I should say that. But our hope should be deepened as we follow the Lord, you know, through the good and through the bad. You all know this verse, Romans 8, 28. You know, all things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. We know this verse, right? But why is it that when we, when we get into this, this, time, this time where the sign says, uh, no right turn, detour is left. It's like, oh, Lord, I don't got time for this. It's going to take me 10 minutes to get through this traffic thing here. You know, when God puts us on that spiritual detour, we all trip out and all that stuff. Wait a minute. And did we forget that all things work together for good to those that love God? Did we forget the verse that says in, in, in James 1 and 17 that, that God is the father of lights and come, what comes down from him is, is the good and the perfect gifts that he's not allowing just nonsensical stuff to drop within our life. 
And in, in, in the big picture that what he had for these Hebrews, for the Israelites, for everything that Samuel was laying out there, he had good for them. But they pushed off of it. They rejected it. They fought God on it. And against all wise counsel, they raged against all the wise counsel and they chose to go their own way. Well, when we allow ourselves, when we allow ourselves to be shaped by God, it brings us to that, that, that third little thing there um, under getting to yes through no. The third thing is that all of these situations, that God uses them to lead us to a place of prayer. Jesus said it best, the, the, uh, uh, the model prayer is he's teaching the disciples how to pray in Matthew chapter six. You know, our father who art in heaven, right? The relational component. But, but then he goes down very quickly here into verse number 10. And, and what do we pray? We, we, we pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. That, that this is the, it's a picture of the heart that has learned relationally because of God's goodness, because of the promises that are contained within the scriptures for us, that, that we've learned by way of reading and personal experience that God is good. And because God is good, we are able to pray, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Even though I don't understand right here in this immediate short term, you know, in this emotional moment or this season of struggle or the pain and the complexity that is falling here, even though I don't understand, I can apprehend and I have experienced you personally through the ups and downs and the various seasons of years and decades of my life of walking with you that I can trust you. And the halls of faith are littered with the men and the women of giving a strong testimony that God is good. And we're able to remain in that place. And it's like, okay, I'm not shaking off a chorus and I'm able to say, Lord, your will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Do, do, do we get that? Do we get the simplicity of that? But the sweet fragrance that spills out of it. Finally, point three for tonight and then we'll make a wrap here on this. Avoid acting independent of God. All right, I'm gonna have you do, um, you know, maybe our, our final set of, of Bible Olympics here. Take your Bible and go all the way to the end of the New Testament, to the book of James. You're just a few books off the back, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe 100 pages or less in front of the book of Revelation, which is the very last book of your Bible. So book of James. God, these glasses are terrible, Jody. You're not going to like me saying that. I just haven't learned to blink fast enough, I guess. <laughs> okay, um, back to our study. Uh, James chapter 4. Uh, take your eyeballs down in James 4. Um, down to verse 13. I'll read here in just a second. Uh, we know that, that James at this point, he's just, he's kind of, he's kind of given a little bit of rebuke here to worldliness, Okay you know, about fighting and all of this nonsensical stuff. Hey, why does all these wars pop up among you here? So he's rebuking the worldliness. And right along with rebuking that worldliness, he gives to us in verse 13 through 17, he says this. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we're gonna go to such and such a city. We're gonna spend a year there. We're gonna buy and sell and we're gonna make a profit. Oh, you're so confident. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and he does not do it, to him it is sin. We started off our study here tonight. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Listen, the, 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 the self-focused individual or the Christian that has fallen into following secular practices because they are the best model of success in 2018 begins to operate in such a way that we're, we're, we're boosting self and we're, we're, we're self-driven and we're, you know, we got this self-focus and self-determination, all of these particular things. Uh, many of you know that I did real estate for about 15 years and when, when, I, when I was practicing real estate uh, in the redevelopment of downtown San Diego, 
that the, the buyer's team that, it, that I was on, they had all these self-affirmations that they would give you in this stack of cards. And you were supposed to look in the mirror every day and say, you are a good salesman and you're gonna close the deal. And all of these particular things, maybe some of you, if you're in sales, you get what I'm saying. All of these affirmations here. Listen, I, I, I wanna tell you, Christian, that when it comes to looking into the scriptures here, that our, our identity is found in Christ, not in the, the promotion of self. Our, our identity is found in Christ in such a way as that God is the one that opens and closes doors before us. Our identity is found in Christ knowing that as I seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, that God is the one that adds all of the blessings to my life. And I want blessings in my life, but I want to get them from the Lord and I don't want to strive to have to get them myself. Because I tell you, in the striving aspect, and Jody and I have done this over the years, and I'm not afraid to tell you this, we made a boatload of money, 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 money. We'd have a boat and we'd float it down the river because we had so much money. I'm not sure if that's totally accurate, but you get my point, okay? <laughs> okay, okay. And the harder I worked and the more I got, listen, I had fancy cars and I, and I was buying Jody different Mercedes every about three years and trading in my little five series Beamer every few years. And I just thought I was cool, cool, cool. And we had the family ski boat and we had, you know, five days, five nights a week eating at the office. Oh, by the way, we're eating at Morton's dropping, you know, 150, 200 bucks a night for meals and all this stuff. It's like, what are you doing, you idiot? I was living for myself. And I realized that the more that I collected, the harder that I had to work to maintain that particular lifestyle. God has not called me to do that. God has called me to yield upon him. And I tell you, I'm super poor now. <laughs> but she still loves me. And I'm going to love her even when her brown hair turns gray. Never. Never. <laughs> Never. My goodness. But I have to tell you, as a type A stress case, I can stress over tying my shoe, okay? I have a lot less stress in my life. I've got relational headaches from people being knuckleheads, but that's never going to go away this side of eternity, okay? And you can identify that. You know, you look in your own family. You know, look across the aisle. Maybe you're fighting with somebody here in the church. I don't know. If you are, stop, okay? Don't do that. That's not, Jesus doesn't want that, so. Um, but I can tell you, the striving aspect is something that I think God wants to take off of our shoulders. I, I, I just believe that the, all, through all the context of, of the New Testament scriptures, there's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with having things. So please don't mishear me on this, okay? I'm not talking down about that. What I'm talking about is moving to a place to where I build my own little pyramid on my own little effort and, 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 and I've got my life so tight and organized according to my plans that I've completely marginalized God out of my life. And the more I get, the harder I have to work to keep what I got because the man is right behind me and he's chasing me. And if I don't continue to produce this or that, or if I'm not advancing here or there, then, then the next thing I know, I'm just sliding down the rung. You in sales, you guys know exactly what that looks like. But we want to avoid acting independently. And what James gives here is this little rebuke of worldliness. And, 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 and for us in practical application, from 1 Samuel chapter 9 and chapter 8, they wanted a king that looked just like the world. Well, Listen, God's people are governed differently than the world. God's people are governed with a hope that there's meaning in the present that we live through because it's creating character within our lives which will carry through all of eternity that God is building in us. Three final things as we go. The benefit of letting God lead. Number one is it frees us from anxiety. When we leave the outcome into God's hands, then it's gonna take away that anxiety. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we, and we rule that off by way of prayer. Second thing is this. Our responsibility is it's, it's reduced. It's reduced to what? The only thing that I'm called to do is to be faithful. Hmm. Well, I, that's a big task, but it's a whole lot less stressful than trying to balance all the balls, if you will. I just, my responsibility is to be faithful. And the third thing is this, 
is the Holy Spirit becomes a referee within our lives. How so? Well, you and I can only see a certain distance around whatever we're in. You know, the, you know be it relationship or the, 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 the aim of our, our life, our home, our jobs, our kids, whatever, whatever. We can only see a certain distance. But, but when I allow the Holy Spirit to take that leadership within my life, well, then the Holy Spirit, according to Colossians 3 and 15, becomes the one that is the referee within my life. The, the, the Holy Spirit gives me the peace that surpasses all understanding. And even when I can't see the outcome of a situation that I can rely upon by asking God, Lord, as you're leading in this, is, is this of you? And if it is, will you give me the peace that surpasses my understanding? That, that passes what I actually see, what I comprehend, what I know, the information I have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it allows us to do life by relying upon God as opposed to relying upon our own abilities or even inabilities. Man, I can rest in that. So how can I go wrong by letting God lead? I don't think we can Isaiah 46 and 10 out of the New Living Translation, it says this, God speaking, only I can tell you the future before it even happens. <laughs> come, Jesus, come, tell me some stories. Everything I plan will come to pass. This is God speaking, for I do whatever I wish. What does that mean? It, it means that there's nothing that is too hard for God. That's all it means. <laughs> and only God can tell us the future before it happens. So if I let God lead in my life and I don't go to the place like what these guys did, remember we're using the historical things that took place to bring current modern day application lessons to our life, application sources. They were in this place of give me, give me, give me, give me. So what was the title of our message tonight? I want what you want. And that's my prayer for you. Is, is that you would begin to crave and to hunger and to thirst after the ways of God, what God wants. Now, the Bible doesn't give us instruction on in every situation for our life. It does give us the principles that pertain to life and to godliness. They're here. And one of the things that we looked at by way of application tonight is allowing God to be in the driver's seat, allowing him to direct our steps. And, and gang, this is what I want to encourage you with as we go. Learning how to let him lead, that's hard. But all the comfort that we have within the scripture, all these particular verses in the promises, man, this is the faithfulness of God poured out you know, on these particular pages, this little love letter here for you and I, so that we can learn to trust him. Thanks for joining us today. If you want to know more about having a real relationship with God, click the Do You Know Him link at westminstercalvary.org. We also would like to invite you to join us for our regular weekly services on Sundays at 8.30 and 10 a.m. or Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. We are conveniently located on the northeast corner of Wadsworth Parkway and Church Ranch Boulevard in the Stanley Lake Marketplace Shopping Center. For more information, please contact our church offices at 303-223-4640. Thanks and God bless. Oh